Dang. Yes, Tell us who ben. you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I'm Dean. I'm married to Jess. And uh, we've got four boys. And at the moment, it's easy to remember their ages because they're two, four, six, and eight. But soon it's going to be confusing. Um, and Jess grew up just out of um, Middleton, but I've been living over here with Jess for, I think this is our seventh year, I reckon. Um, yeah. And work and study, what's And uh, I teach a couple of days a week at Waruka, um, and I'm, I'm leading the children's ministry here and studying a Bachelor of Theology as well. So, uh, yeah, putting all those pieces together. Yes. Um, Dean, you've had a bit of experience working in the AP Wildlands and North East Arnhem Land. Tell us a bit about that. Um, so before uh, I came down here, I, as a new graduate teacher, I taught for three years in Central Australia in the AP Wildlands. Um, and then during that time, Jess and I were married and, um, and then we moved to North East Arnhem Land. And I think um, from, uh, from late high school, I felt, felt a call, a passion um, to work with Indigenous people. When, uh, when I was in year 11, our family did a trip up the centre, um, stopped in Coopedi, Alice Springs, Tennant Creek, all those places along the way uh, to see my auntie and uncle who were living in North East Arnhem Land at the time. And um, that was really my first interaction uh, with a number of Aboriginal people. Um, yeah, growing up in Adelaide, I'd, you know, um, the places where we lived, I just didn't really interact with Aboriginal people that much. And, and I think it was... I remember driving through Alice Springs as a 16-year-old um, and um, seeing a bunch of Aboriginal people sitting on the train tracks... Uh, on the way in through the gap and I I felt I don't know just um, it's funny there's that word in the Bible when it says that Jesus um, has compassion on, on, on people and it's like a wrenching in your guts and that's actually what the word means and it was kind of like that I didn't really know what it meant um, but I thought I'd kind of seek it out so I finished school and then after I finished school I spent three months living in the Gulf of Carpentaria um, working with a, a church leader with an Aboriginal church there and went to study teaching because I thought that was a really good way to um, get into Aboriginal communities and, and serve and during that time I, I, I studied Indigenous studies and so I had um, Indigenous lecturers and, um, and learnt stacks from them and had lots of experiences. Um, yeah, and so then I moved to Central Australia and um, Fregon, where I was working, was in a lot of ways sort of the stereotype of what you think of an Aboriginal community. Um, there was some really good stuff going on. There was some dysfunction as well. And um, working within the school system... Uh, it really struck me that we were kind of working with rules that were made for Adelaide <laughs> in, the, in the middle of Australia in a really different cultural context and it, and it just uh, struck me as, as really strange. Um, but I got to know some really fantastic people there who still contact me to this day over Facebook and, and let me know of things that are going on, which is a, a real blessing. And, they, and um, yeah, I've been really impacted by those those connections and how they last even when you don't chase up. It's, it really is like family, you know, you don't ring them for a couple of years and then you know, get into contact with your, with your aunties or great uncles or whatever and they're always willing to have you around or that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so I had that, that experience in Central Australia and then Jess and I moved to North East Arnhem Land to a place that was a really long way away from anywhere else. Three plane flights from Adelaide. Uh, we had to do ten weeks of shopping at a time 
so that we had enough food. I struggle. I'm in there four days a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, we, we had to be organised at that time. <laughs> and um, the place where we went was really, really different. Uh, the only white people in the community were us, uh, the principal and her husband. And the community was really in control. Like, they were calling the shots in the school. Uh, they were calling the shots of everything. And um, we had an incredible experience of how those um, aspects of Indigenous culture that are often criticised in some areas, here they were working and they were making a, a community that was thriving really strong. Um, you know, there was no drug and alcohol abuse. A couple of times in the three years we were there, someone drove alcohol in and they were kicked out by the morning. Just the community leaders just did it. Um, it was a really strong place. And um, I think, uh, yeah, I, I really started to learn and, and be changed in my faith um, because of that yeah. as well. This week is NAIDOC week, and uh, you might have heard that term. You might not have. And uh, tell us its origins and what it is. Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting. I don't know about anyone in here, but I've, I've never been in a church that's recognised NAIDOC week or, or talked about it at all. And um, I... Over, I've, I've heard this guy's name, William Cooper. He's, he was an Aboriginal leader in the, in the 1930s. I didn't really know much about him, um, but I've been teaching about him at school this year because I wanted to know about him, so I learned about him and, and taught the kids. We've got a picture of and him behind us. He has a fantastic moustache and a really memorable face, <laughs> um, so that's something for you guys to remember. And uh, NAIDOC Week actually has his... Uh, has the origins with, with William Cooper. And it's really interesting that I've never been in a church that's talked about NAIDOC Week because um, William Cooper was a, was a Christian leader in the 1930s and um, it was churches who began this, um, this day of observance that turned into NAIDOC Week. It, it started off as a church thing. And um, so William Cooper, he grew up on the River Murray on a mission, and uh, when he was in his... And, and during his time, he campaigned for the rights of Aboriginal people on the missions. And when he was in his 70s, he couldn't work anymore. Uh, so he wanted to get the pension, but Aboriginal people, because they weren't Australian citizens, you couldn't get the pension by living on a mission because um, you're under the guardianship of the protector of Aborigines for whatever state, so you didn't have any, um, any agency by yourself. The only way he could get the pension is to sign a form which basically signed away his Aboriginality, um, so he was like an honorary white person, and he moved to Footscray. And uh, there he realised that things were not much better for Aboriginal people in the city either. And, uh, and so here we have a news news article, he organised a petition um, to the king, because although Aboriginal people weren't citizens, he thought, well, I'll talk to the king, he might be able to do something for us. And uh, the petition had things like um, recognition in par Aboriginal recognition in Parliament, um, some kind of reparations or, um, or, or land that they can use, um, yeah, a few, a few different things like that, that they would be actually recognised as citizens. And he got 2,000 signatures for that petition. He, sent, he, he met with the Prime Minister to deliver the petition and the Prime Minister at the time said, uh, nah, it's not going to go anywhere and handed the petition back to him. Um, so that, it stopped there, basically. And um, I think this was, this was late 1937 that he was organising this petition and organising an, an organisation, <laughs> getting together an organisation to campaign for Indigenous rights. And um, the reason why he came across this is because when he became a Christian in his 20s, he read the stories of the Exodus and that God was delivering people out of slavery and that, w that resonated with his experience on the mission. And um, he realised that this God was for them and that 
he would um, he would follow God and work with work with churches um, to do this work. So he delivered the petition, got knocked back. Then it was um, it was 1938, so 150 year anniversary of the first fleet. And in Sydney, they were organising big celebrations on Australia Day. Uh, there was going to be a parade. There was going to be a reenactment, and. Uh, None of the Aboriginal people in Sydney wanted to be part of the reenactment, so they gathered some people from Western New South Wales somewhere and brought them to Sydney so that they could act in the reenactment and act running away from the white people, even though that's not what happened. Um, and William Cooper, on the other hand, organised a, a protest, a day of mourning. And um, did we have a, a picture of that as well? Um, on another slide. So there's, yeah, there they are. They, they stood in prominent places in Sydney and said, things aren't right. This is not just a celebration. This is a day of mourning for Aboriginal people, Australia Day. And, um, and so that became a regular thing. And he organised with some churches that they would, on, on the week around Australia Day, that they would um, be preaching about Indigenous issues, um, about um, the gifts that Aboriginal people bring and that justice needed to be done uh, for Indigenous people. He organised that in churches and then later on that's what became NAIDOC Week. Um, so that's yeah, directly from, from his influence and the influence that he had in the churches. Tell us about his protest about Germany. Yeah, and so... Um, Later on in 1938 was um, Kristallnacht in Germany. So uh, the Nazis rounded up in one night, 30,000 Jews. They destroyed Jewish businesses, um, all sorts of stuff. So this is before World War II had begun and it was really a blip for most nations. They weren't really paying attention to what was going on. But William Cooper heard about this. Um, he knew about the Jewish people and he organised another petition and a protest and a bunch of people marched to the German ambassador in Melbourne, mostly Aboriginal people because they were the people that he could actually get to join in the protest against the Nazis and say, what you've done is wrong. And um, they presented the the petition, and that was the only private protest in the entire world against the Nazis before World War II. Um, he was the only only person to organise and speak against what was going on. So, if you go to Israel, mm. if you go to Israel, um, I've I've heard his grandson talk, and his grandson says, "I went to Israel. Everyone knew who William Cooper was. Come to Australia, no one's heard of him before." Um, yeah, it's a, a stunning thing. So, living, learning, growing in this area, how has that shaped your faith, all this experience? And... I think that what um, comes up again and again is that you learn and grow in your faith from people who are different from yourself, who have had different experiences, who, di who know different things. And I know that for me, going to Aboriginal communities ended up... Uh, well, it began as um, sort of a, a missionary enterprise. Like, I had gifts to bring and I needed to help people. But what it ended up being is that I realised that Aboriginal people and, um, and their history and culture and, um, and the way that they follow, follow Jesus is a blessing that needs to be given back to the rest of, um, of the church and the rest of Australia. That, yeah, that, that's what reconciliation is about and that is um, how we grow in our faith as well. It's, it's uh, by learning from other people and um, through all kinds of experiences. It's, you know, it's like Jesus kept talking about. It's the ones that we think don't know need the help, all those kind of things, they're the ones that um, are showing Jesus. 
they're the ones that that can bring bring a, a new insight. Yeah. I wonder if we could just finish this part by praying for Aboriginal Australia. Yeah, sure. Lord God, you are uh, the eternal Father. You are the creator God. In you, all things hold together. Lord, we thank you that, um, that the blessing of you creating everything, holding all things together, has, um, as it says in Romans, been evident to all people at all times throughout all of, all of history. We thank you. Um, we thank you for your son, Jesus, that through Jesus you have been revealed in human form um, you're, and that we cannot mistake what your character is like and that you love the least, you love the left out that they are precious to you. And God, I pray that as a church, our eyes um, will be constantly open to seeing where your kingdom is breaking through, breaking through like that, like that mustard seed and that mustard plant um, through the, the, the trampled down and solid soil. Lord, we pray uh, that your kingdom roots would grow down and that we will be a part of your kingdom that is coming in this world. Help us to play our part. In your name. Amen. Amen.